in a way, it was very much, that's great for, for you guys. You do great content. What about us? We would love to produce great content. We can't produce content like you can produce. The amount of times we've been asked, can we use your studio? I can't even count, right? The amount of times we said, can we use your studio to film? And we were so protective over it. We were like, this is our personal brand. It's weird if you use our studio. And this thing was ringing in my head throughout, throughout the, um, throughout the pandemic speak, speaking to founders. On today's show, we're talking to Graham Hussey, the founder of The Dream Factory, a new epicenter for content for founders and the startup community in London. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast with myself, David Savage, powered by the Harvey Nash Group, where we bring you thought and insight from leaders across the industry and a bit of technology news. Welcome to today's show. I'm joined by Keish. It's a Friday morning. Uh, at the start of a bank holiday weekend. Oh, beautiful. You, you know what What was going through my mind this morning? You know that song? I'm not going to sing it because it'll be bad. But yeah, it's Friday then and Saturday, Sunday. And... I know, I'm, I'm lost. And that's, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally just sang it. Do you want to sing it. that again? I literally just sang it, didn't I? <laughs> oh, no, I don't want to ruin anyone's uh, ears. Okay. Listen to us in, yeah, in headphone format. <laughs> But I didn't realise it was a bank holiday weekend until yesterday. Do you know what? I only found out on Monday because someone made a joke saying, uh, can I get next Monday off? And I was like, what? They're like, uh, just joking. Uh, bank holiday. <laughs> and I was like... I have to say, that's, that's a wonderful sense of humour. Yeah, I know. <laughs> makes makes <laughs> up for their lack of personality anyway. I, w- I won't mention them. <laughs> it's um, funny though, with the whole like, you know, working from home predominantly, mm. it does mean less doesn't it i mean it's not to say that it's not lovely and this is this is probably super kind of um privileged because we're white collar workers in in an office predominantly but when you're when you're not in the office every single day therefore the bank holiday isn't quite so oh yeah like the thing that you kind of like really notice Mm. um it'll still be lovely not to have to do any work but Mm. it does it's not quite so significant the buzz isn't there. Do you, do you remember like coming into the office at this sort of time on a Friday before bank holiday Monday? And it's, mm. you know, it's, it's all a bit busy. It's all a bit frantic and everyone's talking about kind of what they're doing. There's always a few people with little suitcases isn't there next to their desk. Oh yeah. Because Get they away. will. Yeah. Because they're like, you know, I'm taking, going to King's cross and we're going to, you know, somewhere in Europe and we're doing this for bank holiday. So there's always those eager people there. Um, and then there's always the, the people that are just talking about kind of, you know, how, drunk they want to get over the next three nights um yeah good 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 little social i guess little 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 social uh social aspect to it but yeah at the moment you're sat in your house i'm sat in my house and uh, we talk about bank holiday monday on a podcast wow. it's good <laughs> stuff people <laughs> 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 but talking of good content, uh, we might not be producing any right now. Our guest is making sure that there is good content out there because Graham is founder of the Dream Factory, a place that he claims will be the epicenter for content in the startup community. Um, if you're unconvinced now, have a listen and then we'll have some commentary afterwards. So Graham, this is the first time in 18 months I've stuck a microphone in my backpack and actually sat down somewhere other than the office or my home remotely to record a podcast. How's it feel? Yeah, fun. It's good, isn't it? It's nice. I mean, you know, the sound quality means that we're going to get a few people walking past and whatever of else. But that's quite nice. It's good. And as we said, just before we hit record, this is the first piece of content ever <laughs> recorded in this space. Ever. <laughs> Given who you're going to have and what the plans are here at the Dream Factory, I feel that somehow I've I don't know. You, 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 should have, you should have had a bigger name to pop your cherry. No, no way. I wouldn't <laughs> have it any other way. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Look, first of all, if anyone doesn't know you, um, tell us a little bit about your background, Graham. Uh, although you've been on this podcast before, we've picked up a few more listeners. So it'd be good to kind of reacquaint anyone with, with your backstory. Yeah. So short version, because I, I could do the three hour one. Yeah. But no one has time for that, right? Um, co-founded startup fan, probably mm-hmm. most, most well known for entrepreneur entertainment company. Uh, ran that for six years, interviewed 3,000 founders all around the world, most of them uh, right here in London uh, with our daily uh, entrepreneur chat show, which, which we ran for years. Brand new founder every single day, uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, all that sort of stuff. Partnership deal, we worked to produce the most viewed business content in Europe, which was behind the curtain, 
huge guests on that show, really fun time. And that's what I'm most well known for, probably. Uh, well, I hope I'm known somewhat <laughs> for it. Uh, blood, sweat and tears, so I, I hope I'm known for it. And then more recently, Dream Factory, which is, which is the next chapter, which is an exciting one. The Dream Factory is exciting because look, it's kind of cliched in a way, but we sat here in, in Shoreditch and it does feel like, even after the pandemic, that there's life here and that there's something going on. Yeah. And that's really positive because if the country is going to recover from the 18 months that we've had, it needs to be from the ideas and I suppose the verve of people in areas like this, that it's going to generate those opportunities, generate that wealth. And what I do quite like about Dream Factory, and you'll explain this better, is you are moving away from what was undoubtedly successful with Behind the Curtain, where it was big names, and in a way, it was, you were non-corporate, but you almost embraced an element of that, the big corporate of culture, because of the people that you had on the show, yeah. and now here you are, and you're actively embracing pre-seed, people at the very start of the journey, who hopefully will go on to become big names in the future, but they're not there yet. And this is it, this is, we all had time to reflect, and not to get too deep, but we all had time to reflect during the pandemic, right? I was sitting at home doing absolutely nothing, right? I'd love to pretend that I had all these big plans. I was busy planning and squirreling away. I was doing F all. Our surroundings would suggest that's not quite accurate, but I'll... Well, well in the beginning, <laughs> right, okay. In, I'll clarify. In the beginning, I was doing okay. not all that much. So I started to speak with founders about just stuff. I was just bored out of my head. And founders love what we did with Startup Fund. Right? It, was, it was content that they could relate to. Um, relate to in a way of they want to be there. They want to be the Tom Blomfield. They want to be the Roberta Lucas. Mm -hmm. They want to be there. So it was kind of a way to, it was people they looked up to. But it was, in a way, it was very much, that's great for, for you guys. You do great content. What about us? We would love to produce great content. We can't produce content like you can produce. The amount of times we've been asked, can we use your studio? I can't even count. Right, the amount of times, can we use your studio to film? And we were so protective over it. We were like, this is our personal brand. It's weird if you use our studio. And this thing was ringing in my head throughout, throughout, the, um, throughout the pandemic, speak, speaking to founders. And a lot of them started doing Zoom content um, out of necessity, obviously, but, what, but had ambitions to do better content. Hmm. And originally I was gonna do, and no one knows this, exclusive, but I was going to do a production company um, for startups, because that seemed like the thing, they want to create better content, how can I help them create better content, a production company. I spoke to a friend of mine who's um, amazing, one of the best people I've ever met in my life, and, and actually an investor in, in Dream Factory. And he said, do you want to do that every day? I said, yes. <laughs> I'm quite, yes, of course I want to do that every day. And he said, think about it, think about it. Well, I don't think you do, but I can't tell you what, what to do, so think about it. I didn't want to do it every day, really. You're basically just organizing shoots, what's happening, running around, it, it wasn't a thing. And obviously, content creation houses exist. It's a thing, right? You, you, go, to, you go to LA and there's content creation houses for TikTok stars, content creation houses for Instagram stars. I mean, there's, there's pop-up versions of it on a, on a small scale in Westfield now for TikTok, isn't there? So, of course, yeah. right, and that exists. Was like, why does nothing exist for founders? Why, why isn't there a place the founders can go and play and enjoy creating content? Because if there's founders listening to this now, I would bet most of them don't actually enjoy creating content. Probably 90% of them hmm. don't enjoy it. Don't enjoy having one of their marketing people shove an iPhone in their face and be like, <laughs> and be like this, we need to do this video, do this introduction. They don't like it. They don't enjoy it because, this, because it's a bit uncomfortable. But if, I figured if we can get somewhere that's like a playground, Come in with your peers, pump out content, have fun, do, do your, redo your photography, do your podcasting in the best podcast booth you would get your hands on in London, air conditioned, soundproof, acoustics are unbelievable. Use our YouTube studio, do your own shows, do what you wanted to use Startup Fan Studios for, but do it for yourself this time. So let's get into one quick obvious question that mm. I think we should cover off then, because podcast studios, a, a content house, with the best equipment that you can get your hands on and a playground, well, that's an expensive playground, right? Mm. So how do you make it affordable so someone can feel 
like they've got the ability to be creative and to play and to make mistakes and come back and create the content that they want. Yeah, this, this is something that, this was the most difficult thing about putting Dream Factory together. Because there was no way in hell I wanted to do something and, and charge a founder something that would squeeze them too tight, something that would shorten that runway and put them under pressure. Because then it didn't, it didn't make sense, right? Well, you'd end up attracting the wrong audience. You'd try, end up attracting people who've got the money. Of course, which isn't what we wanted to mm -hmm. do. We want to find people who don't have the money to do it, that can create amazing content, that can elevate their business, that can help them get more customers, get more clients, and raise money, or raise money. If you don't want to raise money, that's fine. Get more clients, even better. That's what we wanted to do. So we came in at a price point of £999 per year for a pre-seed founder to join Dream Factory for unlimited content. Come in and record a podcast a week, do your headshots, do your product shots, record a YouTube series, just get it done. Editing as well? That's where we stop. So we had to draw the line somewhere and, and, and that's what we do. So when you, come, when you book the YouTube studio mm -hmm. and you want to do a series about um, sex tech and you want to get sex tech founders in, you want to do an incredible YouTube series. So you book the YouTube studios in Dream Factory for next Friday you automatically, automatically get an email back off Benny, our director of content, that has a storyboard template, a script template, and a questionnaire of why are you creating this content? Where will it be hosted? Is it for brand awareness, new clients, new customers, crowdfunding video? And basically, you have to think through the content. How do I want this to look? How do I want this to feel? And you don't need to be Scorsese, right? But, but you need to think through the content. Once that goes back to Benny, he sits down and he redoes the storyboard if he needs to, makes it flow better, makes it look better, um, because it's very hard to get what's in your head onto the screen. That is a huge gap for founders, and we help you close that gap. Now, we've spoken in the past about the fact that some founders of some of the hottest property in terms of, in terms of the companies out there aren't necessarily great at creating content. Mm. And you're trying to manage the quality control, I suppose, of what's coming out of the Dream Factory, because you want it to look brilliant. Some people go, this is, this is where I'm creating my content. So there's an element of exclusivity here, mm. and you are being quite careful about who you admit into that first cohort. What's the cap in terms of the first year, in terms of the number of founders that you're bringing through the door for membership? A thousand founders. Okay. So, and I think this one will be interesting for the uh, investment community who are undoubtedly interested. Mm. How do you identify the people that you want here, that you think are going to be successful, that will create the content that cuts through? There's basically three things that we look at. And I, I, I would love to say, we have an AI program that, <laughs> that, is, that assesses, uh, it's me and the team over drinks on a Friday, basically. And we sit down and we look at who's applied. So we look at the founder, mm -hmm. see, what have they done before? What skills do they have? Right, so when they fill out the application, they have to say, um, I'm a marketing guru, I'm a growth hacker, I'm a programmer, I'm a, I'm a, I was a previously a CTO at a big company, whatever it might be. So like, well, what skills can they bring to the community? Are they willing to help others in the community? That's a, that's a huge thing. So we need to look at the founder first and foremost, because if we get the community wrong, Dream Factory won't exist. It doesn't matter how good the content is, it doesn't matter how expensive the equipment is, it doesn't matter a better, brilliant street level shortage location, it doesn't matter. People come in, they don't feel the vibe and the energy of good founders. That doesn't matter. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing we look at is the business. So what is the business? Have they raised money? Are they revenue generating? Is it in an interesting space? Right? Have they raised money? Um, when are they raising money next? Which I don't even know if I can say why, why, we're, why we're looking at that. Because uh, I've told you off, Mike. But anyway, we need to look at when are they raising again, <laughs> which I've just given it away. But we need to look at how they're raising again um, because we do want to support these founders every which way we can. Yeah. Um, and, and then the third thing we look at is what content they want to produce. Yeah. So they're the three criteria. I have to say that second point I think is a fair value exchange for what you're providing. Yeah, it is, right? I, I think we're going to have, this is the new epicenter. And that's, of course, I'll say that. I want people to sign up. But it means, I know I put this on 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 LinkedIn the other day, but it means the world to me that I knew founders would like this. You cannot open a place that's a thousand pounds a year if you're pre-seed or fifteen hundred pounds a year if you're a seed stage business to create unbelievable content and founders not love it, right? It's just gonna be a thing. But it means the world that the OGs 
of the London tech startup scene are coming in, mm. saying, I wish this existed. Tom from Monzo said really nice things. He was in last week. He's telling people about it. If this existed when Monzo was starting, they would, used it. he would have used it. They would have pumped out content. They would have interviewed um, the staff. They would have done their updates from here. Said, Just, and because their office was meters away from where this is. Uh, Marta, who runs Google for startups, hugely well-respected in the space, an OG if there ever was one, loves it. She said, this is the new epicenter. So look, th th that is amazing, and it's amazing to get those compliments. But I know that ultimately your passion is content. You started Startup Van because you wanted to create content. Mm. Um, but there was bureaucracy and red tape, and you couldn't create the content that you initially envisaged. And Startup mm. Van was, was effectively a hack to allow you to do that. Yeah. This is the epicenter. Lots of people aren't necessarily in London. With the, with the pandemic, geographical mm. locations becoming less important than it was, and, and that, that's a good thing in, in many regards. So if someone out there wants to create really good content, they can't necessarily get here, they wish they could, but they can't get here, what would you say to them about creating good content from wherever they might be? Lighting. <laughs> good lighting. No, I, I, no I, honestly, I, I would say that just create the content that feels right. And don't be afraid not to use the content. I know it seems like a waste of time, but I, I say it with Dream Factory, but I say it to anyone who creates content elsewhere. People create content, if, if, if it doesn't feel right, if you don't have that gut feeling that it feels right, don't post it, mm. right? It's just, you can do it again. I know it'll take more time. Do it in the evenings, do it in the weekends. But don't be afraid not to use the content you put the time into creating because it is important. It is your, your business, it's your startup, but it's also your personal brand, it's your reputation. If the content doesn't look good, doesn't feel right, doesn't reflect well, don't be afraid not to use the content you produce. Well, look, it's a pleasure to catch up. I really appreciate you uh, letting us in to record on this stage. I'm sure that you will have a lot of interesting people here uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, if there is a founder listening and they're interested in, in becoming a member, how would they go about it? Dreamfactory.ventures. Book a tour if you're in London or even outside London. We've had tons of that. One thing that caught me off guard, people outside London absolutely love it because they want to come in once a month to London, have meetings, create some content and go back to Manchester, Glasgow, Edinburgh, wherever they're from. Um, so even if you're outside London, do have a look, pop in, dreamfactory.ventures. Thanks for your time. Cheers, Dave. The epicenter thing uh, I found quite, quite interesting because at first I was sit sitting there, I'll be honest, mate, uh, kind of going, this is great, but it is again just another London-centric thing and, and from a guy who's from, du from, from, from Dublin, mm. It's a bit of a shame that it, that that's the case, but then that idea that actually you know you can get you can get to the dream factory pretty easily to create content at a very low cost. You know, if you're paying a thousand pounds a month and then you've got access to it, um, sorry, thousand pounds for the year and then you've got yeah. access to it on a month, uh, then that becomes really kind of affordable, even with the travel to the studio and whatnot, because creating content is really costly so somewhere that allows you to do it uh from pretty much anywhere in the uk because you can get there easily enough and um we often have to remind ourselves that, the, the, that this country is not a big one um it's it's a really compelling uh solution let's call it i'm not sure it's not a product uh it's 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 kind of not an event space either but it's a really compelling service that you can offer to founders to, to help them make their mark yeah, hundred percent. And I think where, I think the timing of everything and and kind of, you know, how Graham's kind of looking to pitch this, not pitch, but you know, kind of place this in the market. Um, we've just gone through eighteen months of everyone being sat at home and everyone basically creating content on either Instagram lives, uh, Facebook lives, recording Zoom conversations, uh, TikTok, these sorts of things, right? And I think the I mean, go on YouTube, and if you look at kind of stuff, a lot of the the things over the last year, year and a half have just been, you know, kind of people recording bits and pieces, um, doing their best at editing on their own kind of computer, and that's it. And, you know, because of these studios and spaces being shut. And now, I think in the pandemic, you've got a lot more people that have found that the the only way to reach or one of the best ways to reach at the moment is producing good content and relevant content for their kind of consumers customers you know base of people that they're going for um and it is bloody expensive um you know and and to have a space like that where 
it's a yearly subscription and you can use all the facilities and still know that you can produce it in a kind of professional manner for it to get out there um and to build your brand and and your your kind of organization i think it's great to be honest um and the fact that he was mentioning that you can just come in for a day from edinburgh manchester or something like that mm-hmm. just because they're in london it doesn't mean it's just for london you know based people or and in that regard you can see it becoming an epicenter somewhere that people really come because they get the value of it yeah. um yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You kind of we were talking before we hit record about the feel of it, and there is a bit of a Shoreditchy vibe. Sorry, a Shoreditch house vibe to it, but it's a little bit more grungy in a good way. Mm. But they they've created something which you know you're walking past along the street, and there's a little kind of blue rope across the door. Uh, I'm colorblind, Graham, so if it's not blue, apologies. It might be purple, but um, <laughs> there's a little rope across the door, <laughs> and you walk in, and it feels like it's. You know, I walked in and there were like two people in there. There was Graham and his assistant. And and it still felt like it was somewhere where something was happening. And there were sofas there and it was, they were in the kind of the front space, which was like a, like a large kind of retail space that was just sofas, a platform <laughs> and clearly, clearly uh, space for, for people to come in and and have a beer and and watch the content being made there right off the street. And I love the idea that, you know, you've got this footfall going past all the time in those streets around Shoreditch, full of founders and whatever else. On a Thursday night, they can just finish work, walk along the street, rock up and see what else is going on in the sector and share a beer and, or, or a coffee or whatnot, or a non-alcoholic beer, and uh, and find out and find out what the latest stuff in the industry is, and that's that's really cool. That's that's the kind of thing that we need post-pandemic. I think um, I think also the the fact that there, you know, that the, there is a bit of a community feel. Like you, I've only heard from you, right? Because you went there and and did the kind of interview and stuff but kind of following graham in the past i think, I think the kind of interview is a good description the, the kind of interview, yeah. kind I mean, of interview first yeah. time first time you created it, it popped <laughs> his cherry <laughs> um but yeah like having having followed kind of graham a little bit on kind of socials and we were talking off off air when we didn't hit record about his um behind the curtain stuff with the yeah, start so you from start band stuff yeah yeah exactly so i think i think in terms of um in terms of kind of what he's looking to create and actually having that community, I think is, is great. Um, and I was just on their website actually this morning and the fact that it says like they're actually building a community and it says a strict, no dickhead policy means there's nothing but good vibes, which is from their website. Right. So, yeah. well, this is interesting, right? This, 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 so you walk in and there's a big neon sign on the wall that says, follow your fucking dreams. Yeah. And Graham was like, do I put that on the wall? Is it going to be in, in people's face? Mm. And he's like, but you know what? I'm founder of this business. Mm. And therefore, that allows me to make those decisions. And he's, mm. Graham comes, you know, you, you see him and he's kind of, he looks typically startup y and anti corporate and whatever else. Mm. And he says, no dickheads on his, on his website. On his he website, says, follow yeah. your fucking dreams on the wall. Yeah. But he's, he's, as the, you know, I, I don't need to say this really, but he's super smart. Like he's sharp. He knows exactly what he's doing, mm. and it's kind of that stuff appears flippant, but it's not. It creates this ethos and this immediately people uh, shine. Uh, what's the right word? Schadenfreude or whatever it is. What's that word, Akish? That I now can't think of the German word. Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. You yeah, know, that, yeah, that yeah. Of, I'll, I'll nod and agree, mate. I have no clue. Yeah, about that. yeah. <laughs> that kind of that kind of cloak of bullshit and 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 kind of sensibilities that they take into places like Shoreditch House, where there's this kind of like slight showy aspect to it. Mm, mm. Shannon Freud, I'm sure it's Shannon. I, I, I think this, it is. this is an embarrassing moment. Let's in go the with that. Anyway, us two talking about a word that we're not entirely sure about. There we go. In, in a language um, that neither of us speak. <laughs> it is in English. This is it. It's common usage in English. Oh god, it's terrible. Uh, but the thing is, like, it can be a little bit pretentious. Let's go with that. Mm. The, the startup space can be quite pretentious sometimes, mm. and immediately Graham dispels that. Mm. I th- and, I, and I think that the way he's doing that is probably what will help nurture people in because even that startup space, right? It, it can be very status led because there can be people yeah. that found, you know, or, or started an organization uh, and 
They are through two, three, four rounds of funding. You know, they've appeared in all of these magazines. And even though they still like to call themselves a startup, they're probably, you know, well up to become a kind of SMB or something like that. Um, whereas you might then have a kid who's just finished university and started something and, you know, maybe doesn't have the millions and millions of pounds of funding. And maybe he's just been given, uh, you know, a hundred grand worth of uh, kind of funding by someone, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what Graham's platform does is is it encourages that person with the millions and million pound of funding and the guy who's just started something from his bedroom to all be in the same space and, and share ideas, be creative, create that content and kind of bring something to the community. So, yeah, I mean, we, we kind of alluded to Shoreditch House, not, not kind of dissing them, but you know it's it's definitely less pretentious and you don't need to be yeah. you know all over your instagram to say that you were there um but at the same time there's a definite exclusivity thing about it it's just which is good a very, as well a humble yeah, yeah yeah which is which is good because i think it's more of the we're all here for the one common goal right yeah um as compared to kind of other exclusive um you know type of venues in, in that kind of east of london um so I, I, th I think something like that is great, to be honest. And th there should be a lot more kind of ideas as well, I think, being brought to the table. And especially given that the restrictions are being lifted somewhat and, and social interaction is kind of back and, and, and however you feel comfortable. I mean, we were at an event on, on Wednesday together. Um, yeah. I, th I think to have spaces and have times where you can actually interact with others, because there's going to be so many things that people are going to be thinking about. Um, so many things that people will have in their head that they just want to speak to others. You know, ideas can be created, companies can be, you know, kind of formed. Um, and away from that, you can just be with like-minded people um, in a, in a space that, you know, there's not going to be any dickheads around. As, so as in short, the website. Right? Please, please, can we come along to one of the Thursday shows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We promise we're not dickheads. Uh, but, um, but yeah, no, it'd be, it'd be great um, to kind of see that sort of stuff in, in real life and, and in action. Well, look, let's uh, let's move on to our advert break. Graham, thanks for being our guest. We're going to stay on the content uh, on the content trail uh, in our little bit of technology news by having a having a quick dissection of Joe Rogan. A couple of years ago, Michael and Jacob, two friends from London, were both thinking about their consumption and sustainability as a whole. Michael, a professional footballer at the time, realised he had no options when it came to sustainable sportswear. Overconsumption and underuse was all too common. Hilo was born, a sportswear brand fighting for the planet by changing mindsets. They started with a running shoe made with seven natural materials, and the shoe can be recycled at the end of its life. As a company, they've offset their carbon to beyond zero, making them carbon negative. You can find out more about Hilo and support their mission at hiloathletics.com. That's H-Y-L-O. We support the Hilo movement. Right, Akish, I don't know yeah. whether you've listened to the Joe Rogan experience before, but mm. Joe Rogan is obviously a name that everybody knows. And, and interestingly, even if you haven't watched the show, you may well have seen clips of it shared around like him and elon musk uh smoking smoking weed and stuff mm, mm, i have yeah yeah you have yeah. so i found this quite interesting <laughs> your lack of enthusiasm there for this story <coughs> no let's go try on. that again you've seen that yeah i have seen it yeah i have seen yeah it, yeah. Yeah. yeah all right good <laughs> <laughs> this story's off the verge and it's basically saying that since he's being confined to spotify mm. he's losing his influence and i think this is quite interesting because this is all about like content this show uh this week certainly with the dream factory and also it's kind of very meta because obviously this is a podcast uh joe rogan who had a huge amount of influence in terms of getting guests mm. and in terms of the shareability of a show has suffered and is becoming less relevant, argues The Verge, since he moved to an exclusive deal with Spotify, mm. which you would almost think would be the opposite. Uh, because you'd think that Spotify, massive platform, great place to listen to podcasts. But if you look at the social metrics, it's damaging his um, relevance in the market. That, do you know what? It's a fair point. And, and I think I've noticed this, right? Because 
uh, away from like Elon Musk and stuff, uh, what I used to really like about Joe Rogan was was how he used to get athletes and sports stars and and really open up about their stories and things like that. And I'm just seeing, even though he's still interviewing those types of people and they're appearing on his podcast, I'm seeing less and less of those on like, you know, some of the social accounts that I follow and, um, you know, like YouTube and these sorts of things as well. Do you know what I mean? So I, uh, yeah, I, I, well, that, that's, probably. that's the thing is it's less shareable. So, yeah. so searches for Joe Rogan after he went to Spotify, Yeah, you know, they have dropped um, in terms of the number of followers that guests on his show get, um, they get less of a bump before mm. um, versus after he's gone exclusive. So yeah. if you were a guest on Joe Rogan before going exclusive, you could you could get over 4,000 new followers mm. um, on, on a platform like Twitter. Now it's only just over 2,000. Mm. Um, uh, in terms of the YouTube channel, it's not growing as fast. And this is really interesting. Um Full, you know, full episodes are exclusively on Spotify. I used to be able to watch the whole thing on um, YouTube, uh, and he's missed out. So you've got people like um, uh, the the kind of is it Pew Pew Die Pie or whatever his name is. Yeah. Um, some of those other YouTube stars during the pandemic have really seen an acceleration and growth in their audience. But by going exclusive to Spotify, Joe Rogan's missed out on that, and and he's stopped growing in quite the same way on YouTube, which. It's interesting because Spotify made a really big play to be the podcast platform. But I think what it says to content creators, and look, very few of us are ever going to be in a position where it's like, are we going to sign an exclusive deal with with, with Spotify? <laughs> but if you are trying to create content, and if you li- you've listened to the first half of this and you think Dream Factory sounds great and you're trying to create content, then getting it out on as many different channels and as many different sources and not focusing on one or the other is the best way to go mm. and it's the only way you're going to reach masses and you know kind of have your have your name out there because a lot of people and and I'm, I'm sure kind of you know me and you are different in this i use apple podcasts and and apple music and i know you're you? yeah yeah yeah. And i know you're a spotify guy oh. yeah so between Wait, you're so you use apple music and apple podcasts yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you almost feel like you're in the last decade still. Oh, shut up. I knew you'd say something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but but what I'm trying to say is I listen to Tech Talks on Apple, and I know you listen to it on Spotify and kind of other... I often yeah. listen to it on Deezer or maybe Deezer. I use Google yeah. Podcasts. I, I hop around. Exactly. So, so if you started using Spotify more recently mm. um, than the other part, but I do, I do like Deezer. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, and and also from my personal experience, and, you know, I... I me and a friend started a, a kind of sport related podcast during the, the pandemic. Yes, we've, you did. We've just tried to push it out on as many, um, you know, kind of channels and stuff as well. Because Big Swing, No Ding. Yep. Yeah, cricket podcasts, if anyone's interested. Um, but well, look, here you go, Keish. I'm giving you some advice. When when Spotify come calling, don't go exclusive. Nah, I'm not going to because I don't use it myself. I'll be like, can you teach me how to use Spotify first? Yeah, de- definitely don't go exclusive <laughs> on Apple either. Though. Yeah, no, 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 no. Wait, no, but no, no. but again, it's just about getting your name out there, use the platforms. And to be fair, I personally think, and, and this is a bit sad, but a lot of my stuff that I listen to or listen slash watch is on YouTube. And a lot of these YouTubers and stuff have now got their own kind of podcast shows and these sorts of things. Um, yep. True Geordie is another one who's kind of similar. And I think he's in that sort of area as well. Um, again, you know, much rather listen to that sort of podcast on different platforms as compared to Mr. Rogan. Yeah, I'd like to think I'm the true Geordie of the technology team. I'd like to think you're the true, yeah, true Geordie of, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just true Geordie you of the into South. A, into a, into true Geordie of the right. South. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the true Geordie of Liverpool Street, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Bishop's Gate. Bishop's right. Gate, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I think that'll do for today. We're rambling. Thank you very much for listening. It's a bank holiday weekend, so we'll be back next week probably on Friday. But uh, if you're going to go and enjoy your three days or go on a trip to Europe or get drunk for three days, whatever you're doing, enjoy it.
give you the satisfaction. 